Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm JJ Walsh, based in Hiroshima, Japan. And today we are talking on Seek Sustainable Japan with Tony Vega. Tony Vega is the founder of Tokyo, no, Japan Kyo. I always want to call it Tokyo Kyo for some reason. <laughs> uh, Japan Kyo. Thank you so much for joining, Tony. Thank you for having me. Yeah. It's great to have you on and learn a little bit about the man behind the voice of <laughs> Japan, the Japan Station podcast. And it's yeah. not only Japan Station. Let's talk mm -hmm. about all the things you're doing. <laughs> so you started, you started Japan Kyo yeah. in 2016. Is that right? I believe so. Yeah. And mm -hmm. tell us about the name. Is it Kyo because of Kyoiku, like learning, or is it? So, so okay. So when I started the website, I wanted Japan in it for SEO reasons, right? People looking for Japan stuff should have Japan in the URL. Seemed like a good idea. And I was trying to come up with something with Japan that hadn't been done yet. And then I thought of USA Today. And I thought, oh, well, today is Kyo. Oh, but Kyo also has a whole bunch of other possible interpretations, like Kyoiku. So I thought Kyo was a nice, ambiguous thing that could also, on the basis level, just mean Japan today. So I like it. I like mm -hmm. it. Yeah, that makes sense. Kyo as in today yeah. or happening now or current, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, you also have Ichimon Japan. Tell us yeah. about Ichimon Japan. <laughs> Ichimon Japan is kind of the the place where I go to have fun with my friend, a, a graduate school like classmate of mine. And we both studied Japanese language and linguistics. And we love getting super nerdy about Japanese language and uh, culture and anything. And we ask just silly questions that sometimes us as foreigners maybe visiting or living in Japan or just learning about Japan have like do Japanese people have longer intestines than Westerners? That's something that sometimes you hear in Japan. Like it's come up a couple times for me. And so I do like ridiculous amounts of research into this in Japanese, in English, to try to find some sort of explanation uh, for these silly things that sometimes come up and puzzle us. <laughs> so it's, it is what you're co-hosting with. Yeah. Uh, you did an MA in Japanese. Your co-host yeah. also has an MA in Japanese, both yes. from Hawaii. Uh, so we both studied here in Hawaii, but neither of us are originally from Hawaii, but we both moved here to, um, you know, to attend the master's program. He now lives in Ishikawa prefecture. Okay. How yeah. interesting. And then, mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about Japan station podcast. Yeah. So that started in 2018 and mm -hmm. you do a variety of mm -hmm. topics. Now I've noticed certain themes. You talk to a lot of academics, a lot of do, experts, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. You read a lot of books. Mm -hmm. um, really interesting. Tell us about, a little bit about how that's different from the other work that you do. Sure, sure. So um, Japan Station was, um, well, it was my first podcast. I had been wanting to do one and I thought it was a natural kind of expansion from uh, the website where I was writing about Japan and news and things that were going on in Japan. I thought it was nice to kind of add this sort of personal connection, but also I just really like talking to people. And one of the things that I came to learn from doing a master's degree is that there's tons of really interesting information in the academic world that rarely, if ever, gets out into the general public. So one of the things that I do like to do is talk to academics. I read their books and I try to pick out those things that will really stand out to the average person. And I really try my best to do it in a fun way. I try to get the researchers laughing and really excited about their work. Obviously, if they've you know, done this for years and years or years, they must be passionate about it. So I try to, I try to get that out so that it's not just this kind of dry thing, but I also mix it in with the occasional YouTuber, maybe a musician here or there and, and try to, you know, keep it fun, but, you know, also educational and, and have a few laughs in the process. Yeah, I love it. And we're going to talk about a few of my favorite episodes of oh, Japan thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Station podcast mm -hmm. uh, a little bit later. And then now you've just started at the end of last year, yep. Japan Kyo Docs. Tell mm -hmm. us about that. Sure. So that's our new YouTube channel. And that is really like at best, I guess you could call me like 
the producer of this project because really the, the man behind this, the, the man behind the visuals and stuff is, um, his name is Kyle. He lives in Tokyo. He uh, does the Tokyo Explosion podcast. He's also done a YouTube channel called Hard Officers about video games and stuff. He's just amazing behind the camera. He's the guy that frames the shots and everything and, you know, edit it, edits it all and then we work on it together. But the concept is that um, because, you know, I, I can speak Japanese and, you know, I'm, I'm not a native speaker, but I, I do research in Japanese. I can understand Japanese TV shows. I, I sometimes listen to Japanese podcasts. I, I've, I've come across a lot of interesting people that I thought would make for good content, but I couldn't do it in a podcast format. And Kyle had been looking to team up with somebody so that he could do a different kind of project, um, kind of these documentary style videos. And so we we got to know each other. We really got along really well. And he said, let's try to do this. And so for the most part, what I do is I try to find people with really interesting backstories, some kind of passion, some kind of thing that they're doing that's maybe a little bit different from the mainstream. Um, we've talked to a YouTuber that, you know, his whole thing is he has a pompadour. Like, why why did he choose to have that style? We've talked to um, a, a bar owner um, who used to be a hikikomori and now she runs a lesbian bar and her story is just wonderful. Um, we've talked to an emu rancher in Tokyo and he just edits these beautifully. I do the subtitles. A lot of times I do the interviews remotely. Um, and then, you know, we just work on it together. Say, maybe you can cut this little part here. You can cut this little part here. And we just work together to try to make this thing that, that we're really passionate about, but it also takes a lot of time and effort to put together. <laughs> so, but yeah, we're working hard on that. Awesome. I'm sharing the screen of the, the pompadour now. We'll talk a little <laughs> bit more about that about that yeah. later. But I, yeah. I love how you are choosing your guests. You're talking a lot about subculture, but mm -hmm. also about Japanese language, also mm -hmm. about history and heritage. Mm -hmm. um, now, when I first reached out to you to talk mm -hmm. on Seeking Sustainability Live or has yeah. I'm kind of playing with the idea of changing the title of the talk mm -hmm. show to Seek Sustainable Japan, which I think mm -hmm. might be a little bit more mm -hmm. direct and easier to say. I've been stumbling with Seeking true, true. Sustainability Live since I started two years ago. Isn't that <laughs> funny? Um, but you, you said you're a bit concerned that you're mm -hmm. not actually focused much on sustainability. Mm -hmm. But I would like to say at the very beginning, as people are tuning in, that definitely people, planet, profits in balance is the whole idea of sustainability mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of my focus. And what you are doing by talking about culture and perpetuating a higher quality of life for diverse individuals and have more inclusive society, talking about history, heritage, gender equality, so many of the social issues is so important to shine a light on and have more discussion about, which is definitely a really important part of sustainability in Japan. And we, oh. we don't have a future mm -hmm. if we don't talk about those things and learn how to live together in a, a little bit more positive ways, right? Well, th thank you. Thank you. No, that, that's a, a wonderful like perspective to approach it from. I mean, like I, you know, one of the big things that, that got me into Japan and all that stuff is of course, anime and video games. And I love still talking about that stuff. That stuff does come up from time to time in my content, but there is so much more to Japan than just that. And, you know, for me, a story is a story, you know, whether it's a lesbian bar owner, a, a guy with a pompadour, or um, I don't know, wolves in Japan, et cetera, et cetera. Like I've done so, I don't know, like 150 episodes if you combine everything, maybe, I, I don't know if it's that much, but it's somewhere around there. So I've talked about so many different topics and their stories in language there's stories in people's lives there's stories everywhere and and i just enjoy learning and sharing those stories so yeah <laughs> yeah no it's fabulous and you're you're yeah. great at doing the interviews uh you you have studied japanese for so many years and japanese culture you're very interested in and invested in um one thing people might not know about you is that you started studying in high school and yeah. you came mm -hmm. on the jet program as well mm -hmm. is that right yeah, so I I first started I 
I picked up a book called Easy Hiragana from a Barnes and Noble when I was in like middle school, I think. Um, and then uh, I got the opportunity to study in my high school. So I, I went from there. And then um, when I was in college, I went on a trip, first trip to Japan. After that, I did a study abroad. And then eventually that took me to the JET program where I was three years in Kobe. And you talk very honestly um, in the interviews and in your podcast about your hurdles overcoming uh, sudden blindness as mm. a, a teenager. Um, was mm. language study, like studying Japanese and studying about a different culture and heritage, was that it, it became like a passion for you around mm. the same time? Is that right? Yeah. So um, right as I was finishing high school, I became legally blind. I lost most of my eyesight, but I can still see like if I use magnification um, or up close. Um, so I can still see some, but for the most part, like I can't see people's faces unless they're super close to me or big zoomed in or I can't see street signs, things like that. So, um, you know, right, it was right around that time where I was you know, seriously thinking like, am I going to go study abroad in Japan or this and that? And for a long time, I was thinking like, now I can't do that anymore. But as I, I kept studying Japanese and it, it got to a point where I thought, I think it was like maybe five semesters of Japanese. And it got to this point where I was thinking like, okay, I spent so much time like in college and in high school, um, you know, studying Japanese. It's like, I, I still can't really speak it. So like, what am I going to do from here? Like, am I just going to kind of, brush that away and move on? Or am I going to do something more with this? And that pushed me to study abroad. And um, in the process, of course, it, it, it motivated me to learn Japanese and, and study more because like when, when you can't simply see a street sign, when somebody like says points to like turn there, I, I can't see what they're pointing at. Right. So if I'm lost in a street in Japan and I need that help, I need to be able to explain myself and I need to be able to tell the person, you know, like, I'm sorry, I can't see you. So that was an extra motivating factor. And then, of course, as well, like I said, I do enjoy anime and that kind of thing. And, you know, suddenly, I, unless it's a dub, you know, I became unable to consume this content that I, I really enjoyed. So multiple factors kind of came together to push me to, to, to become even more serious about the language. And in the process, I, I think I, I became like even more appreciative of, you know, learning the language and all the things that come associated with learning the language and spending time there and learning the history and the culture and meeting people and, and connecting with people and traveling and all these things that I, I think for a time when I first started to lose my eyesight, I thought I, I would not be able to do. But thankfully, I that motivated me enough where I proved to myself that I can still do that. So I, I, I'm very happy that I was able to find this thing that pushed me out of that kind of dark period. And now I'm, I'm very happy with what I've accomplished. And I know that I can still keep doing more and more stuff as, as I keep exploring, you know, how to do things. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome to, to find a new focus and mm -hmm. find a new way. And I hear this in mm -hmm. your interviews on Japan Kyo Docs and mm -hmm. some of your podcasts as well, coming out mm -hmm. from your guests. Um, I interviewed Josh Grisdale, who runs Barrier Free Japan. Oh, okay. I'm familiar with and, him. Yeah. And he uh, does great work introducing for people with disabilities how they mm -hmm. can come live, mm -hmm. work, and travel around Japan. Mm -hmm. And it introduces mm -hmm. uh, tips and tricks along the way, as well as advises local businesses how they could do a little bit better to accommodate mm -hmm people with disabilities. Uh, when you were in Japan, mm -hmm. how did you find it compared to America? Um, so it's, it's a really, that's a really broad topic. And there's a lot of angles I can come at this from. But for example, on, on the surface level, when it comes to blindness, there's certain aspects of, of life in at least a Japanese city that are just absolutely wonderful, right? Public transportation. Like one of the reasons why I, I just did not want to live in Florida where I was living for a very long time before I started going to Japan was that you really, you need a car to get around, right? And that is extremely frustrating for someone that wants to do a lot of things in their life, but always has to be dependent on someone else. And so, you know, getting to be in, I, I lived in Osaka, I lived in Kobe, um, getting to be in these big cities where that is not an issue whatsoever. I can go meet my friends, you know, anytime. I don't have to rely on anyone. 
it was it's just absolutely wonderful and freeing and i i I, I love Japan for that's one of the reasons why I love Japan. <laughs> um, so in that sense, you know, you have like the audible crosswalks in a lot of places. You have uh, what they call the tenji broku, which are the um, like raised little lines on the ground. So, you know, you're in like a central part of town. There's these little things here and there that are, are just really nice. And you don't see in all over the place in the U.S., for example. So absolutely wonderful. Um, when it came to studying in Japan, people were super nice. I I did have to take my own like magnification equipment, but they were very accommodating. You know, they gave me the room to to do that. I didn't have to do that in the classroom. If I had to take a test, I could set up my thing there. Um and and just made some wonderful friends. At, at Jet also for the most part I I didn't really have any major issues. I also was able to teach at a school for the blind. And that was one of the best experiences of my life. That was also just such a motivating experience in, in getting to know a lot of other people with visual impairments. And up until that point in my life, I, I hadn't really interacted with that many people with visual impairments. Um, but that that was just such a wonderful experience. And I got to really know that the students, it was tiny classes, like one student, two students, three students in a class. So I really got to know them, personalize my lessons for them. Um, I got to, you know, participate in the sports day, in the culture festival, in the chorus, in their games, and and just in taiko, a whole bunch of stuff. I got to know the teachers, and you know, when I when it came time to leave, like I was, I don't know if I managed to hold back tears. Maybe I didn't, but you know, it, it was that kind of like really really formative experience for me. So there's there's tons of wonderful things that that i've i've experienced you know be that are unique to me in a sense um but i i think that it is in a larger sense you know that's just my experience in a larger sense there are still a lot of hurdles to overcome for people with visual impairments there i do believe that there is still this kind of general idea that um people with visual impairments in japan are going to become acupuncturists or work in some kind of massage chiropractor, something like that. In the school for the blind where I worked at, there were two divisions to the high school. There was the Futsuka, which is just the regular division. And there's the like therapy acupuncture um, division. And so those students got trained in that. And they weren't all just like high school age. There were, you know, adults as well that would come later in life and, and get trained in that. And so I think that the visibility of people with visual impairments in Japan, um, and I mean like social visibility, like when you see them, where they work, like what they do, is is still minimal. I think you see much more variety in the U.S. Um, you see less in Japan. So um, that's my kind of personal like observation. Um, I, I know there are people doing amazing things that are not that you know, acupuncture and stuff that are visually impaired in Japan as well, but as a larger trend, that's the kind of general impression that I've gotten. So I think Japan can still, of course, everybody can still do better. But um, when it came to my personal experiences, I, I'm so happy I went to Japan. <laughs> well, that's great to hear. And that in terms of talking about inclusive and being accepted in society, we want mm -hmm. all members of society to feel like they can have quality lives, right? Yeah, this is a yeah. part of sustainability as well. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. looking for, like you said, it's not perfect, but mm -hmm. it wasn't horrible. You had a good experience. Mm -hmm. There's always ways we can improve. And in yeah. so many, so many things for sustainability, that is exactly what we need to focus on. Mm -hmm. It's it's mm -hmm. impossible to buy things without plastic in Japan, yeah. for example. But yeah. there are some better options, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. looking for those better options, just having an open mind to yeah. making positive change, I think is is really important. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, I, I think, you know, social media and all that, it always pushes the extreme opinion. And, you know, th those opinions sometimes should be heard. And and everybody, like I said, has room for improvement. I have room for improvement. But it's also just because of that. It's also very easy to forget sometimes the good stuff that's around. So I, I always do my best to kind of have a balanced approach to things. Like, I'm not afraid to criticize something if it warrants criticism. But I also acknowledge that, you know, like, Japan is, I, I think it's a place that I really like. I, I love still going back. And yes, it has its problems. But there, I still... I still like it. I still am able to do content about this, you know, years since I started it. I still, you know, it's been, I don't know, like more than 15 years or 20 years that I've been learning about Japan and it's still, 
I still keep going back and learning more and there's still a lot more to to be discussed, I think. Absolutely. And I I really like this approach that you have, uh, which I think I'm doing to a certain extent as well. As an outsider looking at Japan after a lot of time studying and being in Japan and talking to people about Japan, and you're doing the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. And that view from the outside inside view is so interesting and so important for moving the conversation forward. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had that reverse experience when I brought students from Japan to Hawaii. I grew mm -hmm. up in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. My students were researching the internet, finding things they wanted to do, finding things I'd never heard about, sure. right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. then I was like, wait, but this is where I'm from. And then I thought, okay, well, this is why I think I have a role for helping a move and talk about Japan culture and uh, how to make improvements in Japan. Even though I'm not Japanese, mm -hmm. I didn't grow up in Japan. And I, I really see that in the work that you're doing as well, Tony. Oh, thank you. You're, you're talking to experts and insiders about Japan mm -hmm. culture, Japan heritage and language from around the world. But their mm -hmm. insights on that topic help us more deeply understand it you know mm, and yeah. and so really interesting yeah 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 well th thank you that that's very nice coming from someone who produces content like yourself that that you know has to think critically about their own content and other people's content and thinking like is this a person i want to have on my show it's like well thank you for inviting me <laughs> i guess that was a yes <laughs> yeah, yeah. i'm always happy when people say yes you know like someone you're really interested in you're really interested in what they do and yeah. and then they're too busy it's so yeah, yeah. it's sad because i want to help tough, yeah. share what they're doing right exactly yeah, um yeah. but i wanted to ask you that like how do you find your guests how do you choose your topics you talked a little bit before about trying to balance the pop culture mm -hmm. like the the easy catch of the mm -hmm. audience kind of topics with yeah, yeah. the more deep uh subculture type of interviews and stuff how do you how do you decide what to uh, focus on <laughs> it's uh it, well some are people that I seek out. Some are just wonderful little accidents and, and I don't know, everything in between. But, you know, one one thing is, of course, you know, I'm just looking at what's coming out, what what new books are coming out. Like, can I approach this topic in, in a way that I think will be interesting to the audience? Right. And then, you know, I try to I, I often I try to read the book before and, and then, you know, think about, you know, I write my questions and try to find those little nuggets that I think are going to excite the guest, but also the the people listening. Um, other times it's just maybe I, I just happen to stumble across somebody on Twitter. Um, other times, like because here in Hawaii, I've, I've also been working for a magazine um called wasabi we're not publishing right now due to the pandemic but i'm still doing stuff for them um and through that job i've gotten to talk to some really interesting people that i wouldn't have had access to otherwise um i got to do an in-person interview backstage at, at the blaisdell center that means something to you maybe not to the <laughs> viewers but um <laughs> uh, with uh, crystal k the singer um i got to talk to stan sakai somebody else uh, he's a cartoon um, comic book artist that is also from Hawaii. Um, and uh, I, this is not for the podcast, but I got to interview Kei Nishikori, the tennis player in person here in Hawaii. So, I, you know, sometimes these things just pop up. I have the opportunity to do it and I go for it. Other times it's just, you know, finding people online and just trying to think about like, how can I approach this interview? What can I do that I think is going to bring value, bring education and entertainment to the the listeners? Well, I, I think you're doing a great job um, <laughs> sharing sharing the screen right now of Japan yeah. Kyo. Now, japankyo.com is yeah. like your main hub. And then yeah. all the links can go from Japan Kyo. And you yes. often introduce like the latest short documentary from Japan Kyo Docs. Um, yeah. or the latest podcast episode for Ichimon Japan. It, mm -hmm. You can find everything here. Yep. Um, it sounded like you also started with the website writing articles from Japanese news stories yeah. um, in Japanese and picking up on it and trying to be the first to break yep. this story yeah, in yeah. English. Is that right? Yeah. So that was the original kind of idea for the 
website. And right now, because I'm producing like the podcast and helping with the videos, like I don't have time to write articles anymore. But the, the, the whole idea was that I was noticing stories that were, or sometimes just random YouTube videos or random tweets um, that were getting covered by Japanese media that were either not making it into English or were taking maybe two, three days to make it into English. And so I managed to break a few stories that went kind of viral. Um, they got picked up by like major publications like The Sun and Vice and uh, Sora News and, and a bunch of other websites. And so that that I think that started getting some traction and like SEO optimization on the website. Um, and, and a lot of the stories still get hits. Every once in a while, like I still get cited for some random story that I wrote like three or four years ago. Um, like one that I wrote again, three or four years ago was about like this robot wolf that was being used to scare off like deer and pests. And all of a sudden that got cited like maybe a year ago by a whole bunch of stories. So some of these stories, I guess, didn't get much coverage at the time, but sometimes they still kind of pop off. And uh, that's always fun because it's like I, I was just doing it for fun. I wasn't thinking that would be something that would get noticed. But uh, all of a sudden it's like, oh, hey, look, Vice just like linked me <laughs> in their in their story. It's like, that's pretty cool. Like, so yeah, yeah. I Again, I wish I could do that more still, but I just don't have enough time to be doing that. Yeah, I get that. And yeah. uh, you talk about that wolf story. Yeah. Uh, when you interview the Japan wolf historian <laughs> expert raider, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Alex KT Martin, who yeah. I'm going to have on, on my show uh, later this month, talking yeah, about yeah. his uh, tracking of the mm. trackers, of yes, the yes. wolf trackers. <laughs> it's a in great Japan. story. Really interesting episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, great story. Super nice guy. And it, it's just one of, you know, it's this kind of mystery meets nature kind of story that, of course, it makes for a wonderful read and, and a great talk to. Yeah. Uh, looking back through some of your articles, I came mm -hmm. across this one about Echo Ben <laughs> and Japan's answer to environmentally unfriendly disposable bento boxes. Yeah, so yeah. I, I really like this idea. And, you know, this is written maybe a few years ago and yeah, I yeah. don't see it anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it seems like an idea that didn't take off at the time, but it's yeah. a great concept. Uh, you have like a a plastic layer between the bento box and the food right. so that it doesn't get uh, dirty and then right. they can more easily reuse the box itself. They just, I guess, throw away the the top layer plastic, and then, yeah. the plastic that was covering the between the food and the bento box. Yeah, um, yeah, so yeah. it's a great idea. So even even though like some of these articles that you did are years old mm -hmm. i think a lot of them have uh ideas or concepts or stories that are relevant or like fashion they'll keep mm -hmm. coming back right yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah i think i remember that that story about the echo ben I, I think it was a trial in in the tokyo area and it was among like a certain like complex of buildings and so multiple restaurants and, and food places were participating in this which was a really great idea like you know if once you get more than just one place doing this then you know it seems like you can get some momentum going but i like 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 you just said i i keep an eye on japanese news and stuff and i haven't heard any <laughs> updates on that story unfortunately yeah. <laughs> but the whole, you know, the whole concept of reusable, reusable mm -hmm. anything is always better than single use anything. And there's yeah, yeah. too much single use plastics in Japan. You yeah, just yeah, see yeah. so much plastic packaging. Luckily, last year they had the plastic bag, free plastic bag ban, which helped mm -hmm. uh, reduce a lot of the plastic shopping bags. Hawaii mm -hmm. has done this for yep. years, right? Yep. Years and years yeah. ago. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, but one interesting thing that I've noticed as, as someone living in Hawaii is that while, yes, you don't get the free plastic bag at most places, what some places do is they give you a bag without handles. <laughs> so I guess that's some sort of loophole where maybe they allow it because maybe that classifies as like a garbage bag or something because it doesn't have handles. So sometimes oh. when I go get takeout, I'll get like, here you go. And it's like a bag that they tie up so that you can have somewhere to hold it, but it doesn't have handles. <laughs> they, they do that at supermarkets in Japan now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> since since they had you have to charge for the plastic shopping bag yeah. but you can use these plastic bags without handles to mm -hmm. wrap all of your foods and yeah. have multiple plastic 
bags. Uh, it's it's not perfect, but yeah, yeah, it's yeah. the improvement. Progress, progress, <laughs> progress. Yes, progress, yes. progress. Yes. Another article you did years ago was about a website for can I use this onsen if I have tattoos? Oh, yeah, yeah. So that one got some another, attention. Yeah. Another yeah. one, like from years ago, about mm -hmm. the need for more inclusivity. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. the the fashion modern person who has fashionable tattoos mm -hmm, versus mm -hmm. the reason they made this no tattoo allowed rule in the first place, which, which it, is a certain segment of society yeah. that they did not want entering the onsen, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I do remember so that one. Yeah. I, yeah. My, I showed that one to my friend and she said like, well, I didn't even know that like tattoos were supposed to be like not, not good in Japan. Like she, she didn't know that. So hey, that, you know, people apparently I, to us, sometimes that's just such a obvious thing. Like we all know that, but there are people outside of, of our little bubble that don't know about these things. So yeah, hopefully that that helped somebody. <laughs> yeah. And uh, for many years now, I've been working with the inbound travel, like inter international travelers coming to Japan. And mm -hmm. of course, in the last five, 10 years, almost everybody has a tattoo of some kind. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's a really big hurdle in terms of onsens or hotels. They want to welcome everybody, mm -hmm. but there are still these traditional rules which they have to find ways to do a workaround, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's I don't know, it's, it's kind of tricky. And eventually, I guess it's like a numbers thing, right? It's like the more that people come, then the less that they, they have to find ways around it. And eventually it just becomes so much that maybe it's not such a thing anymore, but I don't know. Right. Yeah. Now, uh, one of the main focuses of your podcast and mm -hmm. your, I assume you're going to talk about in your documentaries as well, mm -hmm. is about the Japanese language. And this mm -hmm. is because you studied it. Uh, mm -hmm. as a master's, like a graduate mm -hmm. level degree as well. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed your podcast with Dr. Wesley Robertson. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah. so interesting about <laughs> all the different kinds of Japanese writing and mm -hmm. why. And his passion for mm -hmm. the topic is yeah. so infectious while yeah. you're listening. It was so fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he is a sociolinguist. So what that means is basically you look at how people use language because what we are taught in school is, or like what Japanese people are taught about English in school is like, I am blah, 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 right? Like that's the grammar that people get taught, but that's not how we talk, right? We we break the rules. We, we do stuff that a, a teacher would say is wrong. We create new words. We use language in creative ways. And what sociolinguists do is they, use, they, they record people. They look at like written records and they try to figure out like what people are doing with language. And that was my area of expertise. There's multiple like uh, expertise might be saying too much, but that was like, that was my jam, right? I, I really loved like, like recording people and kind of deconstructing like what they were doing. Um, because to me, as, as a person that was learning Japanese, like that's what I was already kind of doing in a sense. Like I was trying to figure out like, why did they just say that this way? And Dr. Wesley um, Robertson, he, he's a sociolinguist as well. And what he was doing was he was doing that, you know, with the, the hiragana and katakana and kanji, why people were doing things in certain ways using one instead of the other. So when I get to talk to somebody like that, like <laughs> that's like, that's my dream interview. I'm always looking for, you know, the, the sociolinguist that loves like talking about their research and we get to kind of like dig deep into, you know, the, the language and like why some women might say this, but actually it's not only women that use this uh, sentence final particle because also men use it in this way. And what are men doing when they use this traditionally quote unquote female particle? Is this actually a male female distinction or is there something deeper going on there? And you can just dig and dig and dig. <laughs> there's so much to discuss there so i love that stuff i absolutely love that stuff yeah and it's not something i had really thought about before mm -hmm. yeah. and that's for me that's the best kind of podcast or mm -hmm. the best kind of video to watch or the best kind of book to read something mm -hmm. that gives me an idea a new way of looking at something mm -hmm. and then from then on i can't not see yes, it yes, yes, right yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I, so now whenever I see like strange use of, of katakana versus kanji versus hiragana, yeah. I think of what 
you guys were talking about it is so interesting. Yeah, yeah. Like there, there's a reason. Even if the person speaking or writing can't explain it to you, there is something going on there, right? When something that is usually written in hiragana or kanji all of a sudden is written in katakana, there is something going on there. Now, the complicated thing is that not everybody may interpret that in the same exact way. And that is what makes this super, super interesting. There's all sorts of meanings hidden there. And there might be some sort of core thing going on there, but that doesn't mean that everybody interprets it the same way. So I, I like I said, I, I love thinking about this and talking about this kind of stuff. So getting to talk to somebody like him was just super fun. <laughs> yeah. And it, it also, it's not just, I mean, the sociolinguistic part is mm -hmm. so interesting, how it yeah. relates to culture, yeah, how yeah. it relates to bias, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, but also just linguistically, there's mm -hmm. so much confusion mm -hmm. from katakana. Like, mm -hmm. what language is it? It's a foreign language, usually, mm -hmm. but it's often German. It's not mm -hmm. English, right? Yeah. So yeah. I, I had this big confusion the other day. I can't remember what the word was. Um, it was in katakana and mm -hmm. then in romaji in the same word. And I had never seen it before. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what it was. It was like a kind of food that you can reheat. Mm -hmm. uh, it's ready to eat. What's retorte? the idea? Retorte? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. and, I, and they kept saying it to me in English. And I was yeah. like, um, I've never heard that word before. I think that's French, you know? right? Yeah. And apparently it's it's like a German origin, like oh, Arpaito German. Okay. is also yeah, German yeah. origin, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, but yeah. the the impression in Japan is all of these words are English, but mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. quite often you're like, What? And yeah, then yeah, recently yeah. I I did a an article um on my blog about woven city, and I know you've covered this as well, right? Mm -hmm, when mm -hmm. they say woven city though in katakana, it sounds like urban. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uban yeah, yeah. city, right? So <laughs> for years, I heard about this great sustainable idea from Toyota, uh -huh. but I thought it was called urban city because the way it was pronounced sounded almost exactly like urban, right? Yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. Now I'm, yeah. I'm glad to have that confusion you know, like lifted, <laughs> so now I can research more about this exciting project. But it's, yeah. it is a big hurdle, right? Yeah, we we actually I think maybe the next episode of Ichimon Japan is pretty much about this topic. It's all about confusion confusing, sometimes annoying uh, katakana words, um, how sometimes they're actually more accurate to the original uh, or, or language of origin than the English language is to the language of origin, right? Like a lot of times, like, for example, just Jesus, for example, like, yes, I think I think that's actually closer to the Hebrew or whatever. Or that, I, I'm not sure what the original language is, but or there's, there's, Roma. There's, yeah, Roma, yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. Like a yeah. lot of the katakana words for for other countries is actually it's what it should be, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's it's closer. We're messing it of, up in English. Yeah, yeah uh, <laughs> just some very you know Englishized thing that the original speaker might not be able, the original speaker of the language might not be able to identify. But sometimes the katakana is actually more accurate, which ends up being confusing for us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, Italia, Roma, yeah, yeah. cafe, right? Or pan, like, pan, right? Like, I mean, to, to a Spanish speaker, I speak Spanish as well. It's like, oh, I know what that is. But if you don't know Spanish, if you don't know Portuguese, which I believe that's where it's originally from, that's not bread, right? It doesn't sound anything like bread. So you, you, you may not know right away. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so another theme, so language is a very important theme across mm -hmm. your podcast and your, your videos, all your content. Another theme that I've noticed is about uh, connection to society. Now, a lot of the documentaries, uh, like this first one you did about this guy who style his style is a uh, pompadour, mm -hmm. uh, which is it's it's like a mohawk, but it's yeah, like it's a really big. ornate, yeah, yeah. big quaff, big quaff, yeah, yeah. and. It, spends hours on it, but he and a few other people you've interviewed, mm -hmm. um, their costume, so for mm -hmm. him, his hairstyle, has helped him reconnect to society. Mm -hmm. He was kind of isolated. He was kind yeah. of shy before. And then uh, when you talk to the lesbian bar owner in Tokyo, mm -hmm. and she says a very similar thing. She was hikomori. And mm -hmm. then that helped her transition to be more of a communicator, connect with other people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. really beautiful stories you're you're telling on the mm -hmm. documentary channel. 
Thank you. Thank you. That that means a lot. I mean, Kyle, um, like I said, he he's the one who approached me with this idea. And, you know, he really wanted to find, you know, people that have some kind of, you know, passionate kind of story like that, something that might be inspiring in some way to to viewers. And just for example, you know, Yuki, who is the guy with the pompadour, like, you know, you see this guy, he's got a big pompadour, wears leather jackets and sunglasses and, you know, like maybe ripped up jeans or whatever, you know, and, and you have an instant kind of like just assumption of who this person might be. But, you know, I got to interact with him. I was the one that did the interview. I got to set up everything. I talked to him. We did a pre-meeting and I got to know him a little bit. And, you know, the, the person that I got to know was just this super nice guy who just loves fashion. And this this exterior, like you put it, you know, is this kind of his way to like break the ice with people. And he's he's just like, I mean, he, even now he comes off as a little shy sometimes, like even though he does YouTube, he's very like low key, you know, he's not like some, I don't know, like a uh, ruffian or anything like that. <laughs> he's just a really nice guy. And he's the kind of guy that I would love to just go and, Hey, like, let's, let's go grab a drink together or something like that. I want to get to know you better. I want, I want to be friends with you. Right. Like just super nice guy. He just happens to look a certain way, but at the end of the day, he's just, he's just a person like, like you or me, just a normal guy, you know, and, but because of that, you know, it's harder for him to get, you know, the typical office job, you know. So there's certain things that even in Japanese society, even us, you know, we assume about him. But hopefully, I, I think one of the things that we want to do in that interview is just show who he is beyond that surface. And and I think you get a peek into that. Yeah, definitely. And I looked onto his channel that you mm -hmm. link uh, from your interview mm -hmm. and his video to show how he makes his <laughs> yeah. hairstyle yeah. Uh, has 1.5 million views. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. just amazing, right? Of yeah, the yeah. amount of interest. Yeah. But he, he that comes across so well in your interview is that mm -hmm. he's he's just a really nice guy. And yeah. I love that part where he's saying he wishes he had more interest from young girls like he just <laughs> yeah. gets a lot of interest from old men old yeah, men yeah. talking to him right yeah 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 because like for, for anybody that's not aware like the pompadour is this thing associated with like yanki which are these kind of like juvenile delinquents in japan especially from the showa era so we're talking like 30 years ago um or 40 years ago and, and so he was saying in the interview that it's really like these older guys that maybe were kind of these like you know juvenile delinquent ruffian kind of guys that's like oh hey kid you you've got a pompadour hey let's talk let's have drinks but you know in reality of course he's a young guy and, and he you know he wants i don't know if he has a girlfriend or not but um you know he he would prefer to have a nice girl like hey oh hey you look so cool but i guess that doesn't happen too often <laughs> It's great. It's so, so cute. And this yeah. is something about Japanese culture that I come across again and again. When I was a jet, when I came out years mm -hmm. ago as a jet, that that really shocked me how the image of Japanese people is that they're shy. Right. Mm -hmm. But then you would have a school festival. All these really shy students who would never say a thing in the classroom mm -hmm. are on stage doing karaoke performances. Yep. You know, yep. Yep. like there is a real interesting insight there into Japanese culture and how doing an official event or doing an mm -hmm. official speech or wearing a cosplay costume or having a crazy hairstyle mm -hmm. can help you take that scary step mm -hmm. to connect with other people, you know, amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think, and you know, generalizations here, but um, it's not necessarily that people are shy in Japan. Of course, there are plenty of shy people, but, you know, it's more like there's... Um, you know, there's a whole thing of like KY, right? Kuki o yomu. Like you kind of know what the situation is and what you're supposed to do in that situation. And so, you know, it may not be an appropriate situation in the office to break the ice and start talking about your pompadour. But <laughs> if you're walking outside in the street with a pompadour, now people, that's kind of like a, a cue for them to say like, oh, this person must be okay with me approaching them on the street and saying, can I take a picture with you? Right? So the people do find ways and people try to find ways as well to to signal to people like yeah you know like maybe i'm not talking to you in the classroom but i'm actually you know a person that loves to sing i'm actually a person that loves fashion i'm actually a person that loves this or that and in those situations like you were saying in the culture festival they let it all out you know they can be amazing singers they can be amazing uh, whatever it is you know fashion people and and you know they have certain situations where they let it out and so when you see that but you remember back to in the classroom, they go like, well, they weren't saying anything. Like, I didn't know this. But 
there's a person there. We're all just people. It's these kind of little things in society that sometimes make us like push down our personalities. Happens in the U.S. as well, but maybe a little bit more in Japan. And, you know, it's just fun to scratch beyond that surface and get to know these people. Yeah. And it's also a great reminder, right? Mm -hmm. uh, not to judge a book by its cover. Mm -hmm, Someone mm -hmm, might mm -hmm. look like a typical salaryman, but yep. he might be amazing at playing the saxophone. Yep. Like you yep. just, you don't know, like there are so many unique people in Japan, like anywhere. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. there there is a temptation to just assume that everybody is the same. It's mm -hmm, not mm -hmm. a monoculture. Yeah. And that is what I love about all the content you're creating is you are unraveling that stereotype that it is a monoculture because it's not right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah there's all kinds of people i mean you know you may not see it but maybe you gotta know where to look and and hopefully you know the stuff that i'm doing is kind of showing it's like hey look there's all these kinds of people you know they may look uh, different on the exterior but you know we're all just people kind of finding the things that we love to do right and that sense of uh, commonality or trying to make an effort to find out something real about the person is is su such an important reminder, no matter where you live, not yeah. not just Japan, anywhere, exactly. right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, another uh, really great uh, talk that I love listening to was about the onyo. Oh, and you were yeah. talking. You were talking with Jennifer Yu yeah. about her research into mm -hmm. Japanese monsters and ghosts. Mm -hmm. And I had a great discussion with uh, Hiroko and Matt Alt about oh, yeah. Yude mm -hmm. uh, years ago, and they've written uh, great books about monsters and Yude attack. I think is one of their books. Mm -hmm. um, but in this conversation, there's so much about. Japanese history, heritage, her research on gender, gender and yeah. how women were portrayed as ghosts and mm -hmm. the vengeful ghost. Where does that come from? Connected, mm -hmm. you know, compared to the male vengeful ghosts and mm -hmm. how they mm -hmm. would be appeased and stuff. Yeah. Really interesting interview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the big, um, like really simple takeaways that I can bring up from, from that interview is how the the traditionally the classic sort of female ghost tends to be this jilted lover or, or some sort of you know uh wife or something like that right whereas the vengeful male ghost tends to be this usually some important historical figure some politician some ruler you know and and so there's far 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 fewer um male ghosts but they tend to be some sort of um quote-unquote important person whereas a lot of these female ones are nameless kind of allegories the, these these stories that are supposed to characterize i don't know this kind of like uh evil woman sort of thing and, and so it's it's just really interesting to think about what what that does like what impression that leaves us with and that continues to influence you know modern day like these stories live on right like there's tons of these these uh vengeful ghost stories that are still very popular uh, and uh, to some extent also like live on in the form of Sadako from Ringu and, and these other, you know, Japanese horror films. And so Jennifer, a, a really interesting research. She, she's also University of Hawaii um, PhD candidate. And so I, I learned about her through an email that I get from UH still. Um, and, and I watched her presentation. I thought this was really interesting. So uh, thankfully she, she agreed to come on the show and, and yeah, anybody interested, please go, go check that one out. It approaches um, the whole genre of Japanese ghosts in I think a slightly different way yeah definitely worth listening to mm -hmm. uh, we will put all the links below to everything mm -hmm. that we talk about in this episode of course mm -hmm. uh, one of your first documentaries was on the anti-covid wear mm -hmm. a mask Japanese mm -hmm. mascot I love yeah. this yeah. it's so fun and yeah, I love yeah. the idea that the entrepreneur who started it yes he was in the event industry, like promoting yep. events, putting on events, which of course took such a hard hit during yep. coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So he created this kind of positive way to encourage people to wear masks in a very Japanese cute mascot way, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I absolutely love mascots and cute characters. Love them, love them. I love Mondo mascots, the, the Twitter account. I love him. I got to interview him. Great guy. I love what he does. I love these wacky, wacky characters. And so, you know, whenever I get to do something about that, I'm, I'm super happy. And so I, I, he, he actually tipped me off to uh, Koronon, which is this cat mascot that was passing out um, 
uh, the, the masks. And so I, I thought, let's try to figure out who is doing this, right? Like, what, what's the story behind this character? And I'm so happy I did that because, like you said, we, we got to talk to this entrepreneur guy from Osaka, but he was living in Tokyo and he had this sort of event related company. And the story that he tells is just such a nice story. Like he was thinking, like, we're, we're a tiny company. We, we, we're not some medical company. We can't produce a vaccine. We can't medically like help people. What can we do? Okay, I have these employees. Let's design a character. We're just going to try to make people a little bit happier. We're going to pass out masks and we're going to do the tiny thing that we can do to maybe cheer up somebody just for a second. And apparently like the character was pretty popular when they were passing out masks. People were pretty happy and taking pictures and they got all sorts of requests. And it's a very cute character. And, and so rather than, I don't know, just shutting down the company or whatever, I, I'm, I'm sure he wasn't making money, but nevertheless, he, he found a way to do something that that I guess the employees enjoyed, but also brought a little bit of joy to just even me, for example. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I love that kind of story. You know, like you think, I'm sorry with this little mascot. What what the heck kind of story can you get out of that? Actually, there was a really nice story behind that. Yeah, and he was such a positive guy. Like he yeah. was, he said he was worried about starting it. Would people yeah. be upset that he was he was even talking about coronavirus, but they yeah. had so many fans right away. Yeah, 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 People yeah. that loved the mascot idea, loved yeah. to get a mask from the mascot. It's yeah. great. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, everybody has a story, right? It's just you got to sometimes find the right questions to ask, and then you sometimes you get something absolutely wonderful. <laughs> And it reminded me of the the podcast you did with mm -hmm. Dr. Chelsea Shendi Sheeter. Yeah. Because you were talking about her wonderful book about mm -hmm. uh, the co ed revolution and mm -hmm. the student uh, activists mm -hmm. um, that she studied and wrote a beautiful book about, really interesting, but mm -hmm. also about the kaiju yeah. and how, how talking about uh, they don't have many stories yet or mm. anime yet, or pop culture yet, which is mm. connected to mm. coronavirus or climate change, right? Yeah, she yeah. was talking about how Godzilla has like a very climate change focused theme and stuff. So mm -hmm. that's definitely worth listening to, like really interesting variety of topics you had there. Yeah. And what, what, I, what I really enjoy is, you know, the, these... These researchers, you know, they, they spend years doing this. And, you know, I like to find those little nuggets there. But I, I also really, really like for example in the case of dr chelsea Sandy sneeder um like when i when i find this kind of random little thing then i ask the 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 interviewee and all of a sudden they light up and they go like oh i'm so glad you asked me that like after the interview sometimes they'll tell me that and, and they light up and and you know you can hear us laughing and smiling and, and because i just happened to come across this tiny thing that was mentioned somewhere in the book or maybe on their twitter profile and something that maybe they don't get asked a lot about but it turns out to be this thing that they really enjoy and they have a lot to say about and i end up learning and hopefully the listeners end up learning so i to me that's the value of you know, really looking into somebody before you 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 talk to them because you can find these little nuggets that maybe they haven't talked about elsewhere so much. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. that's the value that we can bring to the conversation mm -hmm. as as people who are doing our homework before we talk to people in the interviews. Mm -hmm. Right. And mm -hmm. then you're able to help your guests tell the story in mm -hmm. a way that you found really exciting. So mm -hmm. probably your listener is also really interested in that part of it, right? Mm, yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, I, I think, especially when it comes to audio, um, you know, you, you uh, well, when it comes to audio, all you have is your voice, right? So if, if the listener can hear you smiling, if the listener can hear you laughing, I think that to some degree that gets across and sometimes it's contagious. And, you know, I, I know it happens with me when I'm listening to a podcast and, you know, the, the hosts are having a good time and they're laughing. Sometimes I find myself before I even realize that I'm smiling too. Right. So if I can do that for the listeners in my own little way, then I'm very happy. Awesome. Uh, another one that I was I was really interested. Uh, so many of your podcasts are amazing. <laughs> Thank you. I, Thank I'm you. looking forward to listening to all of them. You <laughs> Thank know, you. I just a recent fan. So yeah. I will I will get to them. But uh, with Dr. Robert Hellyer about the green uh, tea history green tea? Yeah. and the connections of green tea history from Japan in America even yeah. back to the Boston Tea Party. Yeah, it's really yeah. incredible. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I mean, I said it in that interview at the end of the interview, but it's like, 
tea is an interesting topic, but I didn't know how to approach it in a different way. And then I read his book and I went, okay, this is what I was looking for. Because he does the, the history of like green tea in America, but also how it connects back to Japan and China and of course racism and all these various things that happened in the past, I don't know, like century and a half at least. And his own family history that like he has a connection back to like maybe the late Edo period, um, if I remember correctly, where they were like tea traders as well. So there's all these different angles that he brought to to the book and, and, and the, the interview that I thought was a really, really interesting and kind of unique way to uh, tell the story of green tea as it relates to Japan and the U.S. So I, I love finding, you know, the, these ways to cover these topics that you think have been covered a million times. And, and quite frankly, green tea, of course, has, you know, everybody talks about green tea. Everybody knows what it is. But I thought that he did it in a kind of unique and different way. And so I was very happy to get to talk to him about that. Yeah, really interesting. And mm -hmm. uh, the connections, like once again, going back mm -hmm. to that that outside view of Japan insights mm -hmm. that you wouldn't get unless you were outside. You yeah. know what I mean? Like he said mm -hmm. he would his family would never be in America if it mm -hmm. wasn't for Japanese tea. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. there's some really interesting connections between America and Japan there. And then yeah. like in your talk with Dr. Wes, and mm -hmm. he's in Australia, but he's mm -hmm. studying Japanese language, mm -hmm. and he has all these great insights from looking at Japanese language from outside the country. You're yeah, just yeah, yeah. you're helping with what you're doing, Tony. Um, be a bridge. <laughs> Thank right? you. It's, it's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's very nice of you to say. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, I I think this this concept that you you have to be in Japan or you have mm -hmm. to. Uh, be fluent in Japanese to understand mm. or connect with Japanese history, culture, or language is just is not true. And mm. you're you're helping to to show that that there mm. are different ways to appreciate and learn from and connect with Japan in into your life, no matter where you are, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I I do what I can from where I am. I'm not in Japan, but I can still produce um, the best quality content that I can. And um, thanks to having a, a wonderful friend in Tokyo, now I can produce content that is based there as well. And we have a nice uh, mix of it all and hopefully it all complements each other. Now, one more I'd like to point out from the documentary series mm -hmm. uh, before I ask you a question mm -hmm. about what other podcasts you are interested in and you would mm -hmm. like to pay it forward by promoting mm -hmm. someone else. So I'll ask you sure. that in a minute, try okay. to get somebody in mind. <laughs> right. um, but your video uh, with the Ayas Ayachan, the les yeah. lesbian bar owner in Tokyo, mm -hmm. and how she was able to reconnect to her community mm -hmm. and create kind of a welcoming space for mm -hmm. people in the LGBTQ plus communities mm -hmm. and especially women and mm -hmm. uh, making it more inclusive for lesbian women in Japan is, is a topic that we don't often hear about. How did mm -hmm. you connect with Ayasan? Um, so one thing that I um, have been doing is uh, looking at Japanese language, like blogs and articles um, for in, in search of guests, right? Possible interviewees. Um, and, and sometimes like, I just do random, like just whatever occurs to me, like Ikebukuro interesting places or, um, I might uh, Shibuya bar or something just like, but in Japanese. Right. And I try to like find these lists and it was somehow in one of those just random searches that I did, I, I came across, um, a list that had her bar on it. And so then I went to her Twitter and then right on her Twitter, she says like she used to be a hikikomori and uh, but now she runs a bar. And then I, I found her her blog for the bar. And, you know, I, I learned a little bit about her and I thought like this person has a very interesting story. And I, I'm sure like I, I I think this this is something worth telling. And I happened to find an interview article that she did print and I read it and I thought, yeah, th OK perfect person. So I, I reached out to her and she was just incredibly nice, just such a warm person. And um, like, I think you you can obviously you can tell that in the interview, like the way that she tells her story is not in a sad way, despite the fact that she brings up some sad things. She's able to kind of laugh at some of the things that she was doing, laugh at her own mistakes. And, and in the process, at, at least, I, I mean, depends on the person, but I don't get depressed hearing her 
maybe because I already knew the end of the story, but, <laughs> but, you know, I see her laughing kind of at her own story and, and giggling. And, uh, and then, you know, I see that she's just in a, in a place at least happy on the surface. I, I mean, I can't see into her mind, but she seems very happy with where she is and where her life has taken her now. And, and I am so happy that I got to, you know, talk to her and, and interact with her even through like DMs and stuff and always super nice and was allowed us into her bar to film and all that. So yeah, wonderful story. And a really beautiful short, mm -hmm. short film that you've created there. I uh, mm, really enjoyed that. Yeah. Um, so at the end, this mm. is new for 2022. I sure. would like to ask my guests, mm. uh, where do you get inspiration? Like, are you a fan of somebody else's podcasts or video series that uh, keeps you motivated? Um, so I'll, I consume a, a lot of podcasts, uh, but in, in terms of, uh, something that I, I enjoy in the Japan focused area, um, Japan by River Cruise. I do listen to them every week. Um, you've been on the show uh, and I've interviewed Bobby. I've interviewed Ollie, both episodes. You can find them on Japan Station. That was before they were doing the podcast. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I listen to that every week. Another one that I discovered recently, which is uh, it's, it's definitely an academic um, show. So they only speak to academics, but there's a lot of interesting topics there. And, and I may end up stealing a guest or two from there, but, um, I think it's called beyond Japan. Um, I hope I'm getting that right. Uh, it's produced by, uh, I think it's a university and a, a PhD candidate, uh, is the host. And he's had on some really, really interesting, uh, people, a lot of PhD candidates that are doing research into Japan focused topics that because they haven't published their PhD yet, they haven't published a book yet. Like it's not stuff that you can easily find. And so I've listened to some episodes of that and learned some new things that I, I didn't know about. So that's a podcast that I'm, I'm keeping an eye on. And um, like I said, I, it may come a time where I may steal a guest or two. <laughs> It's not stealing. It's uh, <laughs> continuing, continuing yeah, yeah. the conversation. It's asking yeah, more I, questions. <laughs> asking more questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. extending <laughs> it, following up. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tony. Uh, yeah. You are doing such great work. Thank uh, you. Once again, if people want to find out more, check yeah. out japankyo.com. Yep, and you I'll can see there. all of the links to all of the amazing content you're creating. Keep mm. up the good work. Thank and, you for uh, having we'll, me. Thank you. Thank you so we'll much. We'll have to get together again uh, yeah. in uh, about six months' time or years' yeah. time because you are sure, sure. you keep developing <laughs> so much stuff. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And uh, tomorrow I am talking with Nao Fukuoka, and she lives in a rural area of Hiroshima. And she's trying to redevelop the area for tourism, but also just to revitalize that rural area. And the area of Hiroshima she's in is famous for the performance art of Kagura. So we're going to talk about Kagura performance, which is really exciting with costumes and taiko drumming, as well as her remodeling an old abandoned house into something she wants to live in and have guests in. So a lot of interesting things in our talk tomorrow. Please join us at uh, 6 p.m. tomorrow, Japan time. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Tony. Yeah, thank you. See you next time. <laughs>